All right. Hi, everybody. That was a quick little break there. I'm Rob. Uh, thanks for those of you that stuck around from Eric's chat on Happy Little APIs. Uh, it's always good to see you here. Thanks for joining us. Today, we're going to cover AWS Step Function service integrations. Um, and just real quick, what are service integrations? When and why do we use them? Uh, which ones are available for us? And some patterns. We're going to build a couple from scratch uh, using the extensions in Visual Studio Code. We're going to talk about how to migrate existing Lambda loops. That's when you've written this sort of uh, execute, wait, check, retry loop into your step functions workflows. Um, we'll talk about some differences in service integrations with standard and express workflows. And then I'll take your questions. Of course, just like Eric, uh, questions as we go, please, whatever, uh, whatever you want to know, just ask. We're here to make sure that you can build effectively. So uh, let us know how we can do that. A couple things, uh, there's a docs link for you. There's a links link for you. There's a repo link for you. So at any point, um, that you want to get some additional information, just go ahead and use one of those commands here in chat. Uh, and yeah, Travua, Kinesis and Glue. I saw that come up during Eric's chat. Thank you for that feedback. We're going to look for somebody um, who can maybe produce a session on that for you. I can tell you that's not me, um, but it is an interesting topic. Uh, hello, Richard Boyd. Thanks for joining us. Um, so let's get moving, y'all. Let's see what we got here. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these um, straight up before I change this slide, before we go into VS Code. Um, so what are service integrations? Service integrations are just task states in uh, AWS Step Functions. And in fact, I'm going to jump over here. Let's see what we can do. So whenever we talk about task states, um, let's close that. Again, we're using our brand new fancy AWS Step Function support in the Visual Studio Code in the AWS Toolkit for Visual Studio Code. So we'll create a state machine here. That always happens to me on the first time when I'm demoing. I don't know why. I got that luck, y'all. Um, and we'll create a simple one. I'm gonna rip all the states out of here. And so when we talk about these task states, you probably already use a service integration without even knowing about it because an AWS Lambda execution in AWS Step Functions is a service integration. And what it's doing is it's passing a certain amount of information to that service, AWS Lambda in this case, in an integrated manner, and then doing one of three things, which are the patterns. It's either just giving up and going away, it's waiting synchronously for a response, or it's giving it a token to come back whenever it's done and going into sort of a, a sleep state or a hibernation state. So service integrations aren't this exotic thing that you've never seen before, right? Service integrations are how you already build your step functions today. But the difference is you've probably got Lambda functions in your code that do things that other service integrations can handle for you. And so when we talk about service integrations, there's 10 key ones that are supported here. Let me see if I can get that zoomed for you. Yeah. And this is one of the, uh, this is one of the links that's in the chat, just exclamation point links to get those commands. Uh, I think the first, I'm sorry, to get those links. The first one is service integrations. Um, and you see we've got 10 services listed here, AWS Lambda, AWS Batch, Amazon DynamoDB. This means you can execute a Lambda function, run a batch job. You can do put item and get item for a DynamoDB table. We're going to do that today in code. So without invoking a Lambda function, you can just take information out of your state in your step function and just write it out into a DynamoDB table or read an item back to your uh, workflow based on key information that you already have. Extremely powerful integration here. And yes, Richard Boyd, thanks for, uh, uh, and EDJ Geek, thanks for demonstrating the links command for everybody here. Um, you can invoke Fargate tasks for like long running container based task executions. You can publish messages directly to an SNS topic. You can put messages into an SQS queue. Uh, you can run glue jobs for uh, Travua 
So there's an integration there for you, even if I don't know how to use it. Um, you can run Amazon SageMaker workflow so, or, or jobs. So again, a lot of direct integration between AWS Step Functions and Amazon SageMaker. I'd encourage you to look into that if you're doing any uh, machine learning workflows. Uh, EMR for data processing. And of course, you can invoke a Step Functions workflow from Step Functions workflows. So it's like turtles all the way down, y'all. Um, so those are the 10 types of service integrations that we have. Today, I'm going to build a DynamoDB service integration for you, and then an SQS integration and an SNS topic. So we can you know, assume that our use case is some data comes in when our workflow is kicked off. We need to persist that data to the uh, DynamoDB table. Once that's done, we get information back about that job or the confirmation on that operation. And we put that in the SQS queue as a message so that downstream dependencies can take some action based on it. And then we put that information back into notify uh, into a topic. So, Kamen uh, Ochtik. So, mean Kamen. Oh, that's not nice. Hussein, I'm going to modify this. Just because you say stuff in Arabic doesn't mean... Uh, yeah, we're going to have to time you out there. I apologize to any of our viewers. Uh, luckily, I had a mispronunciation on my Arabic there. But um, yeah, that was that was, that was was not something that we would want to see in chat. So apologies. I hope that nobody caught that and you're not offended by it. Um, and then we'll talk about Amazon SNS. And we'll publish a message into the topic as well. So... Let's see where we can start first. Um, I also want to talk about it. If you see across the top here on this page, there's um, these three service integration patterns. And that's request response, run a job, and wait for callback. So request response is like a sort of fire and forget thing, right? You, you execute an API call to the service integration and then you just continue execution of your step function, secure in the knowledge that whatever has happened has happened, right? It's off there doing some other thing. Uh, run a job synchronously when you do the dot sync invocation means your step function blocks and it stops and waits for the response to come back from whatever service integration you have. And then wait for callback is a topic all to itself. It uses tokens that are in your step function workflow execution context, passes that token in the parameters, and then waits until something calls back with that token. And this is where you see really long running processes. Like if you have a manual intervention in your workflow, if you have a space where say, uh, think about a bank, right? And any transaction over $5,000 has to be approved by a human. And so at this point, you could kick off a long running workflow and maybe somebody's sick and it takes until next week, but that's okay because that workflow just sits there until somebody approves it and then it calls back with that token. And I'm gonna show you how to get that information out of your execution context as well. Um, Richard Boyd asks here, can you integrate with WordPress? I cannot, um, but all facetiousness aside, if you were to put your WordPress installation inside a container and run that container as an AWS Fargate task, then you could, in fact, integrate with WordPress. So it's all, uh, it's all sort of dependent on what you're actually trying to accomplish and how that, that model would work. Um, the wait for callback pattern is really powerful. We're not gonna go into it today, but I will have a separate session on that in App 2025, um, dedicated just to that, just to building these long running workflows and handling the outbound, inbound uh, interaction with those waiting for task tokens. All right, so we've talked about all of those. Uh, why should we use them? I skipped over something. Um, I talked about that Lambda loop pattern earlier, right? And in a Lambda loop pattern, you've got the initial invocation, you've got the wait state that you go into your step function, you've got the uh, check state, and then you've got a choice state, all going in a circle. And in fact, let's just go build this, and because this is a pretty common pattern. I know people hate when this happens. Um, don't do this. So I'm gonna tell you in advance, 
don't build this way if you can avoid it. You may need to if there isn't a service integration available for you, but um, don't build this way. Let me emphasize this enough. Don't 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 build this way. Um, but so you invoke a lambda function, it does some great thing, and then you have a wait state, right? So you wait for 60 seconds and you can configure back off and all of this stuff. But then you have to do your uh, check with a Lambda function. So you go to the Lambda task state and we'll call this check if finished. And then you have to have a choice state, right? And if you're wondering, all these code snippets are coming from the um, AWS toolkit for Visual Studio Code. Again, I had a, a launch with Richard Boyd here in the channel that's available in uh, links as well. If you go back to the series playlist, uh, really super powerful from the AWS Step Functions team. And so at this point, you would either go, you know, you check your variable. If it's if it's completed, then you go on to whatever final state we have, right? Um, we'll just call it a lambda pass state. We'll call this, you know, final task. Ta-da. And then if it's not completed, then you go all the way back to the wait state, right? So let me just wire these up for y'all. All right, default. We don't, we don't need a default here because it's gonna be, oh, I do need a default there, default. Go back to wait state. All right. So let's see if we can wire this up. I just want to give you a graph so that you see what this looks like. Next final task, wait state. This needs to be end true. Looks looks like it. Cool, autocomplete. Yeah, that's I'm hitting control space to get those while you're in this states area. Control space gives you a list of um, 12 different predefined snippets here. Seven, uh, seven state types and some service integrations. Um, next choice state, check if finished. So we waited, check if finished. And that goes there. Next needs to be wait state. And I think that's all my red lines, right? States, oh, invoke Lambda function. So that's the first thing we do here. All right, and then hopefully that got rid of, yeah, perfect. I can't believe that went so fast, y'all. That's, uh, that's, that never happens. So if you look over here on the right, we've got this, we do a thing and then we wait and then we check and then we either keep going back through this loop or we go back to our final task. But there's a couple things that we've done here. Uh, one, we've got the wait state is, that's easy, that's a built-in integration. But this check if finished is gonna involve an API call, right? But to have that API call, then we've gotta have uh, a session set up in a Lambda function. So you've got things like code and dependency and publishing and vulnerabilities of dependencies. If you're doing something exotic, um, you've got you know just a lot of complexity there that you don't need if you can use a service integration. So let's say that we were um, you know trying to do uh, some sort of we pu we push something to an SQS queue and we're actually reverse polling the queue to make sure that it hasn't come out this is more applicable for like a batch job where you want to see it run um, in contrast to this let's go ahead and do it with the batch job again we'll create another new state machine and I'll strip out all these states here oops Control space, we give ourselves a manage batch task. And so we need to start here. And at this point, I'm not gonna wire this up. I'm gonna show you how to wire it up. But at this point, we've replaced all of that. Sorry, y'all, I hit uh, command S out of habit like all the time, right? Um, and if we want to make this more analogous to what we had before, we had this final task state, right? And for those of you who are fans of 80s rock, you can begin singing Final Countdown by Europe right now, or also the hit television show Arrested Development. 
But so this is now more analogous to what we had before, right? You run this manage batch task. That's right. It's the final countdown. -na -na -na. I'm not going to sing anymore. Y'all don't worry. This is not, not going to turn into a singing stream. I, I promise, I promise you that. Um, but so you see, we've got this invoke Lambda function that kicked off our batch task. And then instead of doing this loop in the middle, step functions is handling all of that for us. So we've reduced the amount of code that we have to write. We've reduced the number of dependencies that we have. We've reduced the potential for logic errors. Uh, this is like a much, and we've sort of made, we've simplified our understanding of this. And this might seem kind of trivial here with a simple straightforward task, but any of you that use step functions in production know that you get these long workflow string, uh, long workflow definitions with hundreds of states in them and any sort of consistent simplification that you can get is a big win. Um, yeah, almost caught a mute for singing on Twitch. Banana, not banana, we like potato. We usually go with potatoes on this stream. Uh, no reason why, I don't know. I don't even, like, I don't eat that many potatoes. Um, but so if we go back, that's, that's why we use service integrations, right? Is because we wanna change this into this and get all the benefits that come with it. So if we come back here and we look at our batch jobs, and again, because I prefer potatoes, I do not prefer potatoes, uh, I prefer potatoes, right? So these are the different parameters that we can send in, right? And these are just parameters for our batch job We're not gonna get much further into this. I just wanted you to uh, see what we have here. All right, so that's why we build with these. Let me go back to my notes. Any questions here? So the manage batch state definition, question from DJ Concarne. So the manage batch state definition refers to the longer step function definition you defined in the other file. No, these are, two complete, completely separate state machines. Good question. Um, this manage batch task is just a, that just got filled out whenever we use this service integration here. So I hit control space, I select a batch task state, and that's just the default name that it put in, right? So to clear up any confusion here, that's an extra one. We can call this uh, run batch integration on this side ah oh, me and that me and that save i don't know y'all i don't know i gotta get my hand off that command s it's force a habit so this is with the batch integration and then over here we could invoke batch via lambda right and then we need to make these match up and so at this point these have nothing well at every point but it should hopefully be more clear now these have nothing to do with one another, right? This untitled one and graph untitled one is one method of running this batch job using this, what I call a Lambda loop here, where you wait. And then on this side is using the service integration. So you would just sit there and wait for it to complete. All right, hope that answers your question. Let me see, uh, there was an earlier question. So if the first Lambda is not complete, it will fall back to the wait state. Yeah, um, a good example of this is if you're using this for IT infrastructure to restore a backup. So if you use Amazon RDS and you back up your databases on a regular basis, you can restore them across account. To do that takes a meaningful amount of time, right? Like it's, it's minutes and longer. Um, so when you, when you do that, you're gonna wanna start with some sort of timeout and then back off. Uh, Trabu, I'll get to your max retry count here in a second. It's related to the uh, wait state. Um, so this would be a invoke restore backup, and then you would wait for whatever your base is, and then you would call the check backup restore status to see if it's still continuing or if it's completed. Uh, and if it's completed, then you'd move on. If it's still continuing, you'd go back in the wait state. How can I put max retry count um, that is 
from, let me get you a new window here. By the way, y'all, if you haven't figured it out yet, I look up everything. My memory is like, what's the opposite? Is it an elephant that remembers things? See, I don't even know that. I'm the opposite of all of those. Um, in fact, so this site right here is the formal spec. Oh, and Jay Thomerson has dropped that in there for me. Error handling, retrying after an error. Uh, thank you, Jay Thomerson, for the answer as well to that question. Um, what I dropped in there is the link to the Amazon States language definition, which is where um, the formal definition of all of this is. Life is not what you can remember, it is what you can Google. That is correct, except I prefer to say search for on the internet. Um, so we have errors and retrying after errors. Task states, parallel states, and map states may have a field named retry, whose value must be an array of objects called retriers. And here's an example retrier. So we can take this example and dump it back into where were we? An error here. Um, and you can do weird things like this. You can uh, you can like assume success and catch the error. I don't know if that's necessarily the best pattern that I would recommend, but it is a pattern, right? And that way you can limit your number of um, retries. And so here we have the retrier, right? That we would just drop into our task state here when we're checking to see if it's finished. Um, we will try to answer. It was lower case. case. How, say, how dare you say the G word? Look, it's okay. You know, we have competitors, we have partners, it's, it's fine. I just, I just happen to use a different search engine. So, you know, but that's just me. That's just me. Let's see, let's make sure I haven't missed anybody in chat here. State space signal, so much to learn with AWS. Where does one start? Be great if you would put a link to an official guide in your channel info. That's, uh, that is great feedback and there is a ton to learn with AWS. Thanks for sharing that with us. I will talk to the channel people that be and see if we can have that. Oh, look at, look at Richard Board, way, way ahead of me with that uh, getting started. You know, I like to answer all the questions twice. Uh, you can think of it as like my uh, retry state, right? Um, it's the final countdown. E DJ Geek was singing the guitar part to the final countdown as one does, that's proper. Uh, thanks, have a read, how do you try to answer his lowercase? All right, looks like we're all caught up. Let me go back to my agenda here. So we talked about what are service integrations. You already use them in Lambda. Uh, when, when and why do we use them? Which ones are available? And the three patterns, which are the request response, run a job and wait for a callback. Now let's build some from scratch, right? Beyond what we've done here. Um, so first things first, let's go over here. I'm gonna get rid of these little state machines. Don't save, this really like hurts my spirit. You know what I mean? Like I'm a, I'm a saver, I don't, I don't know how not to save. Um, I'm gonna do a little cheat. If you've seen any of my streams, you know that I always do this, I always cheat. I'm going to, directory should be empty, right? Yay. Okay, so whenever I need a cloud formation template, I can't be bothered to learn it. And even though I got this really handy cloud formation uh, extension for VS Code last week during the stream, um, I still do this the old way because I'm a creature of habit. So I do this. I create a SAM CLI app. Uh, if you're not familiar with SAM, Eric Johnson, who was on previously, does sessions with SAM every Thursday, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. Very worthwhile. That's the AWS serverless application model, framework for building serverless applications. Uh, I do it because I'm gonna use one of these transforms here now we can go back in here. We're not gonna need that. That's There's an AWS Lambda function there. We don't need that. We don't need that. We don't need this. All we wanted was this template, all right? So it just it's a cloud formation transform. He uses Golang. I do use Golang. What language is this? Um, 
Well, the cloud formation template is in YAML, but you can also do it in uh, JSON, but I prefer YAML. And uh, yes, I do tend to write my Lambda functions in Go. Uh, it's the one I'm most familiar with. In this case, we're actually gonna rip out all of our functions. What we wanted was to just get this header here for our um, transformation and the format version, which I can never remember. So we don't need any resources and we don't need any outputs at this point. All right, pretty boring cloud formation template. Um, the first integration I said I was gonna build was with Amazon DynamoDB. So we're gonna need a DynamoDB table to do that. So let's call it uh, service, uh, let's just call it demo table. Oh wait, I just remembered y'all, my uh, cloud formation. Actually, I'm not going to do that on this one because it's this is the SAM transform. I'll show you on the next one. Demo table. It is a type AWS serverless simple table, which is one of the um, properties in the AWS SAM. So with just one line here, I can create a DynamoDB table with on-demand capacity, a lot of defaults set, and uh, give it the name that I want. So we're gonna call this uh, service integration table, right? And that's all we need here. So let me make sure my profile is set. Yup, there we go. And we'll run a guided deploy here, Sam deploy dash G or you know what y'all? Over the years, I've begun to prefer the like the spelled out double double dash versions of options. Oh, that's right. It's because I'm in the wrong directory. It always helps to be wherever you think you are. For so many years, I've always done ls before I run a command, and then somebody told me that was silly, and then now look at me. Now I'm here in the wrong directory trying to deploy stuff. So we'll call this service integrations infrastructure i'm a us east 2 builder you build wherever you're happy and then we can take the defaults from here and because of the guided deployment it's going to handle all of this stuff for us um, that's another advantage here that just makes it arguably a little simpler to redeploy than cloud formation if you know the aws cloud formation deploy stack it's the same thing um, but this for me is faster. Let's see what we've got in here. I'm a front end developer trying to get into cloud service. My goal is to get solutions architects or what other certification would you recommend me before applying to a junior position? Um, yeah, uh, as Eric points out there, the developer associate cert is a good one to make sure that you understand um, what you're doing. And if you haven't seen right now, all of your certifications can be done online as well. Uh, but I would also recommend you just build. Just build, 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 build. Building is, um, well, it's your time, but it's also the best way to to catch stuff. And then Ernie J, I was struggling between code and Atom, and it's nice to see how flawless code is on Mac. Yeah, I've used Atom a lot, as well as Sublime Text. Um, I am, I'm a big fan of Visual Studio Code. I'll still use VI from, or Vim from time to time. Um, but there's, yeah, there's a lot to love in uh, VS Code. For sure. Travu, cool, we can trigger any type end of task, timeout or special error in Lambda, make different flow for repeat tasks. That's true. Retriers are complex, beautiful creatures and powerful. Uh, as a front end developer, I would look heavily at Amplify. That's also good advice. I'm gonna go back to building here for a little bit. We're just gonna check in in our console. We've got this stack here that we just built, right? And if we check our resources, we see pretty much exactly what we expected to see, right? We've got this uh, single DynamoDB table here. It doesn't have any items in it. That makes sense because we haven't given it any items. It's got a single primary partition key because we didn't define anything else. Um, it's pretty neat, pretty neat transform, I think. You don't even have to name your table if you're consuming that name uh, dynamically as well. So uh, pretty good stuff there. Now what we wanna do, I'm gonna grab this ARN while we're over here. Might need that in the future. I'm gonna hide this guy and we're gonna build ourselves a new state machine. Create a new step function state machine. Hello world, we like hello world. 
let's uh let's change this to a service integrations demonstration start at write to dynamo db and so i'm going to rip all these states out again and if you were with us when we introduced this sort of the way to model this thing i said we were going to do two things we were going to write some information out to dynamo db we're going to take some of that information and we're going to put it into an sqs queue and then we're going to take some of our remaining information and publish it to an sns topic so we can do that here as we can model that as three past states, right? Um, first things first, I'm gonna need to park that ARN there for a second. It's not gonna like that. Um, whoa. All right. We need three of these. Um, Let's call this one publish to SNS. For now, we're gonna leave it as a past state, end and true. Um, send to SQS, we'll leave it as a past state. Next will be publish to SNS. Um, and the final, the first will be write to DynamoDB with the next of send to SQS. Let me get up here, cut this out again. Again, I tried to save that, y'all. We don't need to save this. And then we can click over here, visualize this, right? So this is exactly what we just talked about from our business process. Uh, we're gonna get some information out of our execution context. We're gonna write it to our DynamoDB table. Uh, and then we're gonna take some of that information, we're gonna send it to SQS and publish it to SNS. At this point, we can go ahead and publish this, uh, step this workflow up to our AWS account. It's not gonna do anything because these are all past states, but that's okay. We get it up there and we integrate it on it. I've pre-created this service integration role. You're gonna wanna do that. Um, we're gonna wanna name it service integration demo. Boom, look at that, lightning fast, lightning fast. And again, as we've shown before, oh, get rid of you. We can go over here and start this execution, right? Let's give it some empty JSON object. Ta-da, execution started. And now if we go back to our console, get ourselves a happy little step functions window there. We see that we've got this single execution that we just saw right now. And it succeeded and it should succeed because it, it didn't do anything, right? And we just passed this, this comes back, our past state, if you see it was uh, manipulating the response data, that just flows through. So awesome, we've got this thing modeled. Now um, we can start building it. And I know it's a little confusing to see all these things just when, uh, you know, when my screen's all blown up. Any questions? Is it possible to use Sam Deploy to use Terraform instead of cloud formation? No, not at this time. Uh, again, the server, the AWS serverless application model is a transformation on top of cloud formation. So it's, uh, it's like a macro that produces pure cloud formation based off some helper functions like the simple table one that we saw. Uh, so the first thing we're going to want to do is change this to a task state. So let's create a task state. And you see uh, DynamoDB isn't one of the supported task states here yet, but that's okay. Um, we'll figure this one out together. We're gonna go through the docs. The docs you'll see are actually pretty helpful here. Don't worry, I'll have rehearsed this and I have code as a fallback, we'll get there. Um, but we're gonna do it from the docs. So again, if you hit that links command in the chat, the first one you're gonna get is to service integrations. And if we go to DynamoDB from there, we can look at the get item and put item operations. Uh, put item just puts a line in there. This is specific to DynamoDB and not to the service integration. So let me close this. Oh, you can also delete item. Sorry, forgot about that and update an item. So all of your CRUD applications are here. So this is an example 
of a task state that retrieves a message from DynamoDB. Let's just pull this whole thing back over, right? And we'll rework this. Whoops. Oh my gosh, y'all, just keys everywhere. Uh, so we'll cut this out. We'll do some formatting. Okay. There we go. And at some point, I've definitely like blasted that. Uh... Oh, look, send message to SQS. That's convenient. Let's just match those up. Get rid of that comma. Okay. So this result path, again, we're going to talk about um, result path, input path, and output path in a future episode. Super critical to understand how you can manipulate those throughout your state. Your state is of a limited size as well. So you want to bring the necessary information through your state, but you also don't want to hold on to things that you don't need. So that's going to be uh, an entire episode devoted to that next time. Um, this is a get item. We're actually going to do the opposite. We're going to do a put item here parameters instead of a key for put item you pass items and this is documented back here um, if you go to sorry item singular but when you put item you at least have to give it an item and a table name and that's all that we're going to do for this basic example so we've got these parameters here items table names i gotta change that back here all right, table name, conveniently, it's just the name and not the ARN. So we can take our table name from our SAM template. And for an item, we're going to provide the required fields, right? This is a map. So we know we had an ID of um, type string, which is our primary key. And I want to show you this, like the syntax that it's got down here. This means it's a string, but it's a, when you do the dot dollar sign, that's a variable string that you're taking out of your state. And when you look at the example they gave us, this is just your state. But I promise you, I would talk about the execution context. The execution context is available underneath the uh, double dollar sign object. And in fact, I'm gonna cheat real quick over here. Yeah, this gives you access to the entire object. In our case, we are concerned about the execution ID. So all we're gonna do here is write the step functions execution ID of the currently executing workflow as the ID in the DynamoDB table. So this is interesting if you wanted to track metadata or other information about your step functions executions, right? You can pass this in as your primary key. This is the full ARN. I'm not gonna munge it here. Um, you're welcome to if you want. You can also do things like, um, I don't know, name is gonna be a, and each of these needs to be defined this way. So it's a string, um, Rob. Right, or you can use, let's say audience, or let's say channel, right? I'm trying to come up with things that make sense to us now. And again, you can use a, a string from your state, but in this case, we'll take it from the state object itself. Now what this means is in the JSON path in, of the event, you remember we passed an empty JSON object last time? This means we need to pass it some sort of uh, string at the top level of our input that is of type channel. Otherwise, this won't make any sense. And now we have the result path storing it in DynamoDB. We can revisualize this. It's happy. Everybody's happy. Happy little state machines. And we can update this state machine. Successfully updated. Super. All right. So back over here, if we want to do another execution, Remember this time, I'm going to move this over here. We're going to close this. Now we have to provide that channel string up here at the top level of our input. So this is what is being, it's one time, oh, trademark infringement. Oh, because it's a happy little 
Happy little state machines. Soft state machines. How about that? Um, so channel AWS Twitch. Um, infringement. Just so you see it's in real time. And now we execute it. And that execution is started. And now we come back over here to our state machine. Super, always happy to see green. We just ran our second execution. And let's, before we go check DynamoDB, let's look at the state and what passed through, right? So this, right to DynamoDB is the first step and it gets the unfiltered input that we passed it. AWS Twitch infringement for, uh, as penance for my infringing on Eric's copyright of happy little AWS services. Um, and then in the output, we see that we've kept that but we've also got all the metadata returned by that DynamoDB put item call, right? So we can even tie up this Amazon request, X Amazon request ID here for tracing other purposes like that. The request ID is tracked. Uh, so we get all of this back and we can filter it. Again, if you're looking at this after the fact, if you're running big executions, you don't wanna keep all of this to learn how to get rid of it, come join us for a future session. Uh, but now we can go over here and we can look. Initially, we had no items, and now we have one. And you see that we passed it this static string, that name Rob. Let me close this. That name Rob came from this constant that we've defined. See how that's got no, um, where's my, there's my mouse. That doesn't have any, it's not pulling from any variables or any objects. Uh, the channel is in the input object that we passed it, and that's a single dollar sign. And then the ID is this double dollar sign, which goes back to the execution ID of our current state machine. And you can see if we expand this, maybe I'll let me grab that, that this matches this 2F324, this matches our execution over here, right? Pretty crazy stuff, right? So you have access to everything that's in the state and you have access to the execution environment. Um, why did I show you that? I showed you that because another thing that's in there, let's back up here, is your task token. So that's one way of getting your token is by getting it from the context object. So you see, we dealt with this execution ID here. We would also have access to the input. That is the original input that you receive on the execution. But then you've got this task.token, right? So in fact, just for the purposes of this, let's go back and change that to our task.token. So you have a little example of how to extract that and pass it in, oh man, with the save key, and how to pass it in whenever you're doing your service integration. So I'm gonna update this real quick. Quick update, yay. We're gonna start another one, channel, task, token. I'm just putting that, in. it doesn't make any sense as a channel, but whatever. It's just so that we see the difference in DynamoDB. Oh, I bet I got an error. What have I done? <sighs> right to DynamoDB was canceled. Let's see. Hmm. Let's look at our logs. Execution failed. The JSON path task.token could not be found in the input execution. Oh, yeah, that was silly. Um, I didn't call. <laughs> I didn't call a, uh, a wait type task, so it doesn't create a token. Um, that, was a, that was a silly change for me to make. Um, if you call one of the wait tasks, then it will create that token for you. So for now, let's change this back to the execution ID. All right. And that's our DynamoDB input. Uh, the next thing we want to do is send a message to SQS. So instead of a pass state, we're going to use the SQS service integration here, SQS task state. SQS, Amazon SQS, 
um, the first public AWS service, Amazon SQS. It's a managed queue, uh, been around for years. And if you're familiar with something like Celery in the Python environment, uh, Sidekick in the Ruby Rails environment, that's what you got here. It's a queue. There's a ton of functionality in it. You can have unordered queues, FIFO queues. Um, we're just going to be using a simple unordered queue here. Let me change this. Again, it meets all of our serverless tenants. You don't have to provision anything. You just say, I want a queue here, and then you start putting messages into it, and then you have something pull that queue to take the messages out of it. So we just need to define this. Um, again, this is a burner account, so I'm gonna have to take this account number out of here. It's okay that you're seeing it. Normally, you'd wanna define that dynamically. Uh, oh, my queue, we don't have a queue yet y'all so let's make a queue and this is where i said i'd show you the uh cloud formation so again control space and do sqs queue see that first one's highlighted enter boom and we've got all of the uh, properties that we could put in here so let's call it demo queue we'll give it a name service integration queue i'm super creative y'all Ooh. I hope I got that muted in time. It's allergy season around here. Lots of pollen. Um, I'm not gonna mess with any of this. All we have to do is give it a name, right? And we go back here, Sam deploy again. It's uploaded that chain set. It's gonna create this queue for us. While it does that, we can take our queue name Oh, successfully completed. We can take our queue name and we'll put it in here, right? Service integration queue. So message body. Here you can do the same stuff as before, right? Um, however you want to define variables, etc. cetera. Um, if you want to use variables though, wherever in the JSON path, wherever you put your variable, I don't know why that's not clicking off of there for me. There we go. Then you need to tell it that you're giving it a variable. So in this case, we're just gonna take, uh, what did I pass it before? The entire DynamoDB response object, I believe. Let's see. Yeah, so let's go back and see where we were putting our response. It's just in the default. And we look in our output and we just get this thing back, DynamoDB. So we're just gonna pass that entire message, the response that we get back into uh, as our SQS message. So dollar sign dot DynamoDB. Then all we have to do is wire these up again. And so now we see that we've, with the save, now we see that we've um, created our SQS queue and it's ready for us to put messages into. So again, we'll publish it, give ourselves an update. Successfully updated, ta-da. Uh, I don't need to go to this anymore because we have it over here. Still got that same input that we want. And there our execution has started. So we can come back over here. We should have a fourth execution. This one succeeded. And again, if we look at this step now, we see that we've got all of our SQS output has replaced our input state. It's because we didn't give it a, a result path. So it's just given us the entire output is our message ID. So if we want to prove this out to ourselves, a couple things here, right? So now we have this uh, item that was just written into our DynamoDB table. But we can also go over to SQS, look in our queue here, and pull for some messages, right? 
So we have to start polling for messages and look, we see we have this one. And this is exactly the response that we got from DynamoDB. So you can do this with any part of the state that you're pushing through your step function. So this isn't anything that we inserted into our step function originally. This is the dynamic result of the service integration with DynamoDB. And now we're pulling that back out and pushing it into our SQS queue. All right, so you see, it's just a matter of chaining these paths through here to write it. Let me close this and give a little more space here. This result path, we make this first service integration, we write our record out to DynamoDB, and that gives us a response. And we, restore, we store that response in the defined result path. That's why it existed alongside it. Well, we forgot to do that for our SQS. So we can call our result path here, SQS. And now with the save, if we update this and rerun it, now we'll see that we're no longer overwriting all of the state, we're inserting that response beside the state. So we can execute this again and go back to the step functions console. And now when we go to this send message to SQS, we see that we started out with input we gave it, information that we got from DynamoDB as our input, and now our output carries all that information forward and adds the result of our SQS task, right? So we're building this state as we go along. And again, we need to make sure that we're not exceeding the maximum size of the state, which I believe is 32K of text. Somebody please correct me if I'm wrong on that one. Um, but we're at 50 minutes here. I wanna see if there are any questions. The SNS one works the same way. I can just show it to you real quick. Again, it's as much using the, uh, the toolkit as it is coding. But so we had this publish to SNS get ourselves an SNS task state. Again, define an SNS topic for ourselves here using the cloud formation snippets. Oops, didn't want a policy. Display name is only if you're sending SMS messages. We don't need it. We're not defining any subscriptions. So we can call it service integration topic. Save this deploy it, and now it's gonna go create an SNS topic for us. And you can see that this is all just gonna look the same, right? We have to give it a name here. We can take the account ID from here in SQS, region, US East two, rather than show you the whole input thing again, we'll just leave that there. Um, publish to SNS. We need to mark that as our final state. I will save this at the end, so it'll be available for you using the uh, GitHub command. You see that we've got this created here. Um, to prove to ourselves that things come through, SNS is a little trickier. I'm not gonna build up a reader for that now, but we can at least see the messages or the subscriptions come through it. We'll update this one. Initiate another execution. And then again, I don't think I provided any result path here. So, our final state for our state machine is going to be the output of that SNS service integration. So if we go back here to this execution, we see that we now have different type of metadata and this is just your SNS topic response.
Let's see, we've got one topic. No subscriptions on it, which is correct. So it's not going anywhere. We're, we're publishing into the wind right now, right? But so this is how you could use that SNS topic to alert a Slack channel or send an email to an email distribution list that a task completed successfully or unsuccessfully. The point is you shouldn't be creating a Lambda function to publish an SNS message. Use those 10 service integrations that are there for you. Again, we can go back and look at that list. You've got Lambda, Batch, DynamoDB, uh, containers, SNS, SQS, Glue, SageMaker, EMR, and Step Functions. Use those integrations. Anytime that you're running those uh, types of tasks, don't wrap them in a Lambda. Use the direct uh, Step Functions integration. It'll save you a lot of time. It'll simplify your workflow definitions and uh, save you writing code, right? So it's also more maintainable, like the runtime doesn't change out from underneath you. So it looks like there weren't a lot of questions at the end there. I know that was a lot in the weeds, but I wanted you to have like individual examples of those three services because I think those are the most common. So think about where you have um, publication to SQSQs, SNS topics, or storing or retrieving data from items from DynamoDB. Think about where you can go in and refactor those out of your code and replace them with service integrations and step functions. All right. So I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. Um, I will be here next week. The topic next week is parallelism and concurrency in step functions, which is one of my favorite things, right? We, we talk about these things in demos and ones, but the reality is we're handling these things in production in hundreds, thousands, millions, right? So where do you split those? Where do you run parallel step functions workflows? Where do you run dynamic parallelism or map state inside a single workflow? And where do you lean on the parallelization of your language, especially if you're using something with, uh, it's famous for concurrency like Go, right? So I'll bring you some examples of that, of when you would choose one over the other and how you can manage that next week. Same time, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific on Tuesdays here on the AWS channel. Join me also on Thursday, same time, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific for App 2025 when we build uh, the app of the future based on Amazon EventBridge and AWS Step Functions, all right? Uh, thank you all for joining today. Appreciate your time and uh, now go build, right?